Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome international television journalist, Eleni Gioco. Mm -hmm. Right, a very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be with you today. Uh, we are going to be discussing Africa in the context of beyond the boom. And when we say the boom, we know that Sub-Saharan Africa is home to some of the fastest growing economies in the world. That said, we've seen commodity prices taking a significant knock over the past few months. And in fact, year to date, uh, the oil price has dropped by around 30%, putting oil producing economies under pressure. We also know that budget deficits are increasing in these countries. We're also very much aware of debt to GDP rising, perhaps across the board. And when we talk about 4.5% growth, it's pretty good, but is it good enough? And can it be sustained? And as we start to see global growth coming under pressure, that obviously has a massive knock-on effect on Africa as well. So what are governments going to do to diversify Africa's economies going forward? Have we diversified enough? And examples like Nigeria and Ghana coming under pressure, that obviously is bringing up a lot of issues. I'd also like to mention my home country, South Africa. Second quarter growth of this year, contracting by 1.2%. Are we sitting at a very pivotal point in terms of where Africa is going to go? On the right path, or perhaps a path of more pain. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today, and uh, we'll be discussing how we can invest further in the continent, which sectors are we going to see more growth in, and of course, which sectors are we going to see uh, pushing growth going forward. Uh, joining us now is Madeleine Baer. She's the president of the Gabonese uh, Employers Federation and director of Deloitte Gabon. We have Isabella da Costa Mendes, MD at FKS Capital Partners, Jean-Louis Ekra, Chairman and President of African uh, Export-Import Bank. We also have Christopher Marx, Senior Advisor at the African Development Bank, and Brian Manal, Principal and CEO of Kemet Group. I welcome you. Isabella, I'd like to start off with you. All right, so we're worried about the US, we're worried about free money and cheap money not coming back into the continent because global growth perhaps has started to recover after the financial crisis, but it's now coming under pressure. We're worried about China. We're worried about an interest rate hike in the US. Where does that leave African growth? Um, thank you, Eleni. Um, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, we believe that the, the international uh, uh, scenario is challenging somewhat. Obviously, for some countries that are oil exporting countries, just commodities in general, uh, copper prices are down. <coughs> Sorry. Everything is um, uh, generally down in the commodity space, as we discussed. Uh, Africa still is a net importer of oil overall. Um, we believe that the, uh, the opportunity in Africa is still very, very good, very robust. Um, we think that the demographics alone are going to generate a lot of growth. We believe that uh, uh, governments are doing a lot of the right things that are required in order to stimulate growth. We have a, a good level of uh, fiscal discipline across the, uh, uh, the continent. Uh, reforms are being uh, made. We have uh, um, a, a determined uh, effort uh, to develop an infrastructure in the country, in the countries in question, and uh, Gabon is uh, one of the examples. Diversifying the economy, we see most countries taking uh, uh, very good steps towards the diversification, and um, we still see very, very uh, uh, strong interest from investors uh, into the continent. So uh, overall, a positive picture is what you're painting. Uh, absolutely. So we, sh we, we, see very very, uh, we see a potential for, for growth still uh, very strong. Okay, fantastic. Um, Madeline, I'd like to take this to you because we're talking about the oil price and we're talking about commodities coming under pressure. Gabon is obviously very much exposed to this market. And in fact, 52% of government income and 80% of export revenue in Gabon comes from oil. Are you concerned? It is a concern. This country's uh, economy was uh, basically turned towards uh, exporting raw materials and mainly oil. Uh, today, the decrease in the cost of the barrel is uh, a source of concern for us. There are effects on our economy. We had a decrease in growth. We've had uh, uh, investment uh, budgets reduced. So there's a constraint, and we have to adapt to the transformation. 
Uh, the transformation is uh, the project I started uh, in the wood uh, area, which is a big resource in this country, and we export wood. So we've uh, switched, we've done a switchover in trading uh, and moving towards industrialization of this. And we've gone through a few steps already in our um, and in our in the private sector today. We're trying to adapt to these new projects and modification the change. So today. And, and what sectors are you mostly looking at? We know agriculture is a sector that is that needs a, bit, a, a lot of focus. Le, mais un axe, un axe this is one area which today is going to bear growth. It's something that is new. It's not developed. We have uh, projects that are currently being set up with uh, public-private partnerships with uh, uh, in foreign investors. And what our wish is uh, that this should prosper, but for uh, for it to for it to prosper, we need to move forward. We need to have a specific legal framework. We need to set up infrastructures uh, because a project such as one in agriculture it, it needs to be industrialized. Uh, the effects of that industry on the food industry would be it would be major. So to set up this type of project, we have to put into place the framework that would be appropriate to engender trust. When you do oil, it's easy, you sell it. But in order to set up a mechanism to finance agriculture and to industrialize it, you need to secure it. You need earth, you need the real estate, um, and you need machines, and you need uh, funding. Uh, for the tooling, and that's what we're putting into place so as to able to succeed in, in making this effort in diversification. There are others as well, but I'll just talk about that given the time we have. We'll talk only about agriculture. There are obviously other areas where we need to evolve and invest in, uh, and do communication, um, develop business and trade. We have sev several sectors we're insisting on, but uh, we have to do a convergence between all of the players, both public and private, so that we can succeed together and succeed. In, we need to succeed succeed in this diversification with the, the countries of the region. Okay, Christopher, I'd like to take this uh, to you. And, and you know, when we look at developmental money across uh, the continent, there's a ma massive concern that it's not being spent effectively. We know that Gabon is an example, uh, issued a euro bond in June, $500 million. Uh, and we know that they're looking to diversify the economy further with uh, this money. Do you think that generally when we see African economies raising capital or looking for developmental money, that it's being spent in the right way? What has your experience been? I suppose an important element to remember as we talk about the end of the commodity super cycle is that the liquidity super cycle is also coming to an end. And therefore, the availability of funds either domestically or particularly internationally is something that needs to be used with great care. Um, it is true, as we talk about diversification, away, away from familiar projects, familiar sectors, familiar experiences, you unavoidably provoke a longer-term vision requiring not necessarily liquidity, but upfront project development, planning across all the linkages in the value chain. And that's where development banks, I suspect, are probably not well used. They look at us as sources of cheap liquidity, in the same ways the capital markets were previously, rather than thinking of us as interactive partners who can work through the entire chain from policy support, product development, and eventually cheap liquidity as well. Okay, well, let me ask you this. I mean, is there enough liquidity to cater for Africa's needs? There is unquestionably enough money internationally and through the donor agencies. I know it seems counterintuitive, but the, the scarcity of bankable projects is a source of great frustration. And I know it's counterintuitive, but particularly, as I said, as we move into new sectors and new projects, it requires a different frame of thinking and perhaps association of Very different Very good partners. point. I mean, bankable projects and the fact that there's a scarcity thereof, and I'm sure Jean-Louis would be able to tell us what you're seeing at the moment. Uh, are you battling to find projects? Yes, we, I can't give you a, an order of magnitude. When I was living in Cairo just a couple of weeks ago, yeah. our total pipeline has now reached 45, 45 billion dollars of projects that were requests for financing for our bank. Uh, when we look at what's going on right now, I think we are very pleased 
about that uh, the commodity problem. Because it's now time for Africa to look at other things that extractive industries. And it's definitely, in our view, a blessing in, in disguise. We started a program for transforming cocoa in Africa. Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Ghana, and Cameroon, those four countries, everybody knows now, account for about 80 to 85 percent of the cocoa of the world. The less than 20 percent of it is transformed locally. Now, what does transformation mean? It means value addition. It means job creation. And it means increasing the revenues for government. Because if you have more turnover, you have more taxable income. And we want to go through to palm oil, to cashew nuts, to she nuts, and so on. Because there's so much of those which are produced in our continent which did value addition. So we are getting Yeah, I mean, Jean-Louis, I've, I've spoken to you a lot over the past year, and I know that you're an advocate of the fact that we are exporting raw cocoa, but yet we don't have any plants on the continent where we can produce our own chocolates. Mm -hmm. And this has been one of your bugbears. I know that you focus on, I mean, this is something that you've spoken about significantly over the past while. Have you seen any change? We have. You know, uh, for the first time in the history, a country like Ivory Coast, is now transforming about 50% of its cocoa. So it's changing, and it's going, it's going to continue. And it's not only those areas. If you look at telecom, there is so much happening in telecom. You look at the financial sector, financial services, so much also is, is happening there. You look at various infrastructure, power. There's so much to, to be done there. So in our view, looking at also the fact that you have had a growing middle class in the continent, it's also high time to focus on that yeah. middle class, how to cater for their needs, because middle class are middle class everywhere in the world. So Brian, we know that you know, your, your uh, company focuses on managing natural resources across Africa and obviously investing in, in various projects. What have you seen by way of investment within the natural resource space? And I mean, John Louis was saying that it's going to force us to move away from the extractive industry space. Where does that leave uh, oil and gas and other commodity uh, uh, sectors? Well, this year, lower commodity market environment has retarded investment and development in those sectors that are suffering from lower global prices. But I think it's worth us stepping back from my own business and my own interest to look at the positive side of a lower oil price environment and commodity price environment because it does have a positive side for encouraging and catalyzing the type of developments and evolution of African growth that we've been talking about. You know, oil, I don't believe, has been a curse for those countries um, that have benefited from the oil boom, as some people have suggested. It has has positive impact on building government capacity and building infrastructure and building a rich elite which can comp participate in the next phase of funding and developing the economy's diversity. But it has been a drug, and it has been a drug that has retarded the paradigm shift that is underway in Africa, which is a paradigm shift away from growth dependent or focused on foreign direct investment and growth directed and focused on extractive industries, and a paradigm shift towards um, economic growth that is driven by local innovation, local and regional investment, and, and, and partnerships of equals with foreign players in service industries as opposed to purely yeah. extractive industries that do not add value or create economic yeah. benefits in the local countries beyond the specific extractive operations. And therefore, it's actually an enormously and exciting and positive time despite the stress that businesses such as my own, and we are in natural resources in mining and oil, but also in financial services and, and technology and transformation, transportation and energy, and therefore we're not subject to all of the negatives of the present market conditions, but we are, I, I think an example perhaps was the, uh, of 
where we're going in terms of a new model of African development is the announcement we saw yesterday of the creation of Fly Africa, which is an African response to an African challenge um, that creates an African opportunity um, that was a product of, of an African entrepreneur, Ivor Richie Kovitz, and an African president, President Ali Bongo here in Gabon, looking at the desperate need for cheap regional and, and, and domestic air transportation links across the African continent. And oil continent. prices are low now, so I think it will benefit. Sorry? <laughs> it will benefit the company because the oil prices are low now as well. Yeah, no, exactly. so they're positive spin-offs. And that's, you know, yeah. obviously the next phase of their development will involve international capital. And, you know, the Boeing jets that the company flies are built in Seattle but it's an African solution to an African problem, creating okay. an African opportunity. And that's the future, and that's the future that will be catalyzed and made quicker by a low oil price environment, despite the pain of, of us weaning ourselves off a drug that governments and systems and, and structures in oil-producing countries have become dependent on. And that's a good point. And again, we have to mention, we're worried about oil, oil producers on the continent, but at the same time, Africa is still a net oil importer. And in fact, in fact, we see a lot of subsidies across the board. So low oil prices are generally very good, especially for growing countries. I know that we, we have a lot of you to go to. Isabella, I know that you want to jump in here. So yeah. tell us. And I think to, to follow on for, from uh, what Brian said, lower commodities prices, even for those investing in the extractive industries, obviously, that puts a pressure on their operating costs. So investment in infrastructure by governments to reduce, to create power um, alternative, transportation, ports, roads, airports, whatever it is. One of the biggest uh, uh, um, costs of producers in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa is not cost of the extraction itself, it's transportation, it's the power supply. Yeah. So with government's budgets under pressure, uh, for the oil uh, um, producing countries, making efficient investments and bringing in foreign capital through PPPs uh, to reduce costs of operating in these countries is crucial. So I think a crisis um, makes governments be more efficient, create the legal uh, uh, and political environment to, to, uh, to help long-term investment in infrastructure to reduce the overall cost of doing business. Uh, Christopher. No, I was just going to add on, uh, it's a comment you think about as you reduce if the operating cost, particularly in countries in the interior, where you have transportation corridors, these are long, these are big, expensive exercises, mm -hmm. but they transform both the productive capacity of the country that is the arterial hub, Ivory Coast is an excellent example, as the arterial hub for the Sahel, but you can make the same case for Zambia, massive transportation projects leading out to Zambia to the deep water ports in Nakala, you have the north-south the north corridor going through Joburg, Harare, Lusaka, and headed up to Dar es Salaam. But it's long-term thinking. These are different projects require a different frame, different set of partners. The sums are enormous. Um, and the only other comment I wanted to make, which refers back to the airline comment, something like tourism. It's another sector which, certainly for the development agencies, we've had trouble with historically. It's viewed as something which has benefited foreigners historically. But globally, most of the tourism trade is intra-regional. Um, and it's moving beyond places like Sharm el-Sheikh, relatively low margin, very popular areas for tourism, and things that are more sophisticated, higher value added. Um, Rwanda is a much celebrated example where they have a world-class tourism asset in the gorillas, but which is reaching saturation point. So they have moved to a business tourism model to take advantage. People come, but then you can take advantage and gain extra value through a conference center. It's very intelligent, much higher value added, better environmental impact. All right, so. Uh, 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 let yeah, me, let me add just some. one small mm -hmm. point on that tourism. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a point that in Africa there is not enough good hotels. You know, when you organize events, it's very difficult to find hotels in all, all our continents. So we've developed a product which we call Construction Tourism uh, Relay Facility, whereby we help African promoters to develop hotels. We've done it in Ivory Coast, in Mali. We've done several in uh, Nigeria. What it means is that when an investor now comes into a country is familiar with the type of hotel he's finding there. 
And because he's familiar with the type of hotel, he will come back. Yeah. And it's very important that we develop this uh, construction tourism type of uh, uh, program. All right, so we um, have only around 15 minutes left or so. I'm going to allow you to ask questions in just a moment. So start jotting down your thoughts. So I'll come to you in just a moment. I just want to put it out there. We are going to be uh, throwing uh, to the audience in just a few moments. I want to get one last uh, comment from Madeleine, and I'd, I'd like to uh, focus on the fact that we've seen, again, a push for diversification in the likes of Gabon. But at the same time, I know that you're working um, with uh, the Federation of Employees. And what's interesting to note is that where the job growth is going to come from in Africa, everyone is asking where uh, the sectors, which sectors are going to create the most jobs. What in your mind are you planning to see uh, in Gabon? Where do you think the big growth is going to come from? Earlier we spoke and you said the biggest employer in the country is still the oil and gas industry. In Gabon, employment was both it's the, in the public sector and you also have the oil sector and the mining sector, which are major employers. Today, um, the growth areas uh, are in agriculture, and in agriculture, we have self-employed. We also have uh, development of infrastructures, because obviously, if we diversify in agriculture, it's not in silos only. For example, we're going to be uh, working on other areas. The effort of diversification in this priority sector in Gabon is industrialization. So we have to involve industrialization, which is going to create new jobs, uh, new businesses, and new educational content needs to be created and new curricula in, in that context. With diversification in new technologies, in agriculture, and in other uh, sectors, we will have the um, jobs that are will be available. So today, if I had to summarize the situation, I would say it's the public sector and the public function that is one of the biggest employers in Gabon. Then you have the oil industry and all of the other uh, service companies. And then there's agriculture employs almost no one outside of a few companies that work in that area. Agro-food needs to be developed. New technologies would be worthy of effort. Effort. We're not doing much there. So I, I could say that even in the infrastructures and in construction, uh, road, new roads, Gabon is, is really a, a boulevard for growth. There are many things that remain to be done. We just need to set up the right tools. We need to have develop convergence to work in the same direction so that all of what we want to do together can have a positive impact on our economy. Fantastic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Great. questions from the audience. I know you, sir, had your hand up first. Right, uh, that's number four. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ralph Tani, uh, KRM Associates Advisory. My question is to the panel as a whole. I think the theme of this uh, discussion is uh, beyond the boom. And my question is, what boom? The reason is Africa, uh, most African countries say they rely on agriculture for about 80% of their labor force. and only about 3% of the educational system, or actually admissions into universities, are into agriculture. Yet Africa spends more than $200 billion every year importing food. Africa hasn't got food security and nutrition. Now, what are we talking about the boom in Africa? All right, thank you very much. And uh, Brian, yes, uh, the panel is for us. It's an interesting question because, in fact, I we're not seeing commercial farming uh, being a big player yet. Yeah, I think it's a very good question because it is a misleading title to the debate. Um, it shouldn't be beyond the boom because the boom has just started and the boom is the new model of African development which is domestically driven rather than internationally yeah, precisely. driven. And therefore, we are in the beginning of the boom, not beyond the boom. And therefore, the question should be not how we encourage investment from foreign sources of capital to continue to fuel Africa's development in a low oil price environment, the question should be how we use the low oil price environment to catalyze and speed up the evolution of African development away from a dependent on foreign investment to a dependence on local innovation, local capital, local dynamism, and, and, and local and regional African self-determination. So I agree with you, the question's wrong. 
All right, uh, other questions? Uh, move over here, so over here. Again, that's number four. Bonjour, je suis Kek Sanussi et je suis président de l'Institut international de la question de international institute in dispute resolution. I'd like to ask you, Madame Nadia or Mr. Gra, in your presentations about investments, we have followed this very closely. What about bimaterial investment? Are you comparing this today with the third industrial revolution in raw materials? But today in Gabon, for example, what dynamic is involved in investing in, in equipment? and in training so that this type of investment can be sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're right. Uh, immaterial things are hard to finance because when a banker needs to finance something tangible, he needs to finance something where he can, you know, he can see at, he can take a look at. In oil, I'm going to finance a tool. I can, uh, I can take a, a warranty on the equipment. I can, I can. Uh, it, there's some kind of security involved in the investment today. Gabon has set up full-fledged programs to set up training today in new technologies, for example. I'll give you that example because I think in the immaterial issues, training is part of that. Even I, in what I do, is not palpable. I'm a legal counsel. When I see, uh, when I sell services, he says, oh, it's expensive because it's not easy. But there's an area that needs to be worked on, and that is training. We need to train young people in new technologies, in innovation. We need to take that into account. I don't have the feeling that innovation or rather technology today or new technologies are not uh, an area where that's sensitive to fund funding because our country, uh, we're much more interested in agriculture. We import a great deal here. We import a great deal of food. We need to make huge efforts in this, in this area. And that is concrete. We need to be uh, self-sufficient. And we want to uh, finance distribution channels for this type of production. Uh, that uh, would be more uh, tangible, more concrete. Insofar as new technologies are concerned, efforts are being made. We still need, however, a bit more uh, of fiber optics and so forth. And I think we've already had funding in those aspects, but we need to go much further. And I believe that we still have a, a great need uh, for help to uh, encourage investments of those types. But I want to say it again, Gabon is a boulevard uh, for growth. We have so many things to be done. We have so many projects to set up. We have a growth potential, and I can uh, ensure, I can assure you that this will go beyond our borders. Today, Gabon is one point in what I would call uh, the pay Africa as a country. We forget that there are 54 countries in Africa. We forget that there are several countries because for the other countries, Africa is one thing. So what we need on our level is to try to concentrate on this and say we are one and to try to move forward together. And unfortunately, it's always parcellary. It's by silos. So let's be, let's work together. We need to be one because that, that's the way we're looked at. They never say Gabon. They never say Côte d'Ivoire. They say Africa. Thank you so very much. Brilliant. Uh, gentlemen over here, and um, that's number three. Or number one, or whoever's closer. All right, that's the number one. Thank you. Well, Thierry uh, Sam, uh, Gabonese Youth Active, we talked about growth and we talked about the past. The past. Uh, there's a past where you have a certain number of international institutions like the World Bank, where we had some structural adjustments. What was that? It was engagements from the state and then the program of 
vaccination today, you say that it's the public sector uh, which is the employer. Well, this public sector, who public servants, has the most biggest number of employees. Now, of course, the state mustn't go away from that. Even if the state has to make some economies, it is international institu inter institutions which must fund uh, this, and uh, state must put some restrictive policies for banks. Let me explain what I say. Banks should accept more duration for reimbursing loans. Uh, so I want to ask questions to the financial institutions. You said Gabon is a boulevard, is a boulevard for investment. Yes, and this forum must help you so that financial institutions do... Well, we're running out of time. Yes, but uh, I'm just uh, asking questions to the institutional, uh, financial institutions so that the government be helped. Christopher, would you like to tackle this one? Um, there was no question. It was, I know. You I were saying, saying that the developmental banks no, should very be quickly, just to, yeah. I, I certainly respect and appreciate the gentleman's heartfelt sentiment. He obviously cares very strongly, and he is entirely correct that it is not always true that, inter that financial institutions domestically and internationally are as efficient as they might be. I think it is probably fair to say that over time we have learned to be more efficient at allocating monies both for the government and for the use of individuals at home. Um, but it is clear that the sentiment that is felt yes, at the household level is often frustrating. All right, John, Louis. Yes. No, I would like also to object that the government anywhere is a larger employer of anything. Yes. It's, it's not true. The larger employer in Africa are essentially in agriculture, and it's not government. Government is not in agriculture. Mm -hmm. They are in the informal sector. There's a lot of employment that are there. And we, we should just, you know, when we continue to talk about the past, it's not good. It's important to talk about the future. Yeah. This, the structural adjustment program in Africa stopped in 2000, year 2000. We are now in 2015. I think we should put that behind us and look forward. One very good thing, though, most African countries now are developing programs which they call emerging. Yeah. You know, Ivory Coast will be an emerging country, mm. 2020, Gabon emerging, Senegal, and so on. I think it's a very good thing because at least there is a target. Now let's work towards achieving targets because there's no need. You know, we have a say in my country if your neighbor is pain because he's lost someone. You don't help him, he's going next to him and crying with him. Make such a thing that he doesn't, he stop crying. So we should not continue to just uh, look at the past and say government is not doing, government should not do anything because it's not their role to, to create jobs. Job is created by the private sector. Well, else you'll Government like has Greece, to hey, do the soft env environment mm -hmm. so that they can invest. That's why I said you'll end up like Greece if government is only the big employer and you don't want to land up in that position. Mm -hmm. Isabella. Yeah, and uh, actually to, to add to that, I think part of the, the restructuring of African debt in the past, today Africa enjoys some of the lowest debt to GDP uh, levels Racism. of any continent, right? We stand around 30% for most countries. This would cause envy at any European uh, uh, government. Clearly, debt here is more expensive and it's shorter term, so governments should be very cautious about indebting themselves further. So there were benefits about the, 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 um, the restructuring, um, the painful restructuring that happened in the, uh, in the uh, early 2000s. And looking forward, I think uh, I go back to the point it's essential that governments create the, uh, the legal and the political environment, environment for foreign investment or domestic investment to thrive and to come in the long term. And uh, this is what will make growth sustainable, I think, on the continent. Fantastic. We're going to go to last comments from all our panelists before we wrap up, and then you can go to lunch. 
Brian, if you could just uh, give us a comment. I mean, what do you foresee going forward? Is this a time where we should be worried and do you think we can get it right? I don't think so. I think going forward we'll see more diversification and more domestically driven growth and development. And I think the point that's just been made about government's role is a crucial one. You know, in the present low commodity price and low oil price environment, governments have a challenge. And the challenge is not to take that environment as a signal to tighten up and try and exert more control, but to take it as an opportunity to get out of the way and allow the economy to grow with the ingenuity and the energy and dynamism of the people. Fantastic. Christopher, last comments. I think following on with the same spirit, I think it will be an excellent occasion to introduce new partners to the continent, working in new areas, different scales of activity. I think you'll see a much more diverse and interesting range of activity over the next few years. I think there's more effort from government to do in the enabling environment. You know, we shouldn't stop. We should continue to encourage uh, investment. And when we say investment, not only foreign investment, but domestic investment too. That's my view. Isabella. Um, as investors, we see as the, the main challenge, there are four, we've identified four, uh, four in, uh, um, targets for government. One, investment in human capital. The other one is increasing the, the um, political and, um, and economic environment to allow uh, growth, diversification, as everybody said, and then tackling the infrastructure deficit. Fantastic. Madeleine. Nous avons toutes les cartes en main. Prenons-nous en charge et puis mettons toutes nos énergies ensemble. Now we have everything is in our hand, basically. So uh, let's do it so that Africa can uh, develop by itself, uh, uh, move and use the assets of everyone, uh, use and uh, the assets and take advantage of what our neighbor country do. Ladies and gentlemen, a massive round of applause for our fabulous panel this afternoon. Thank you so very much for your insights. And uh, we now invite you for lunch. And uh, don't forget, as the day goes on, we'll be bringing you more insights uh, from our guests. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your afternoon.